Ben, um, I must have done a pretty good job last time. <laughs> I think I solved all the uh, problems of the world. Yeah. I'm simply suggesting that everybody ought to major in college in biology. Um, <clears throat> at least minor in biology. At least biology with a good natural history course. Eat the microphone, please. A good natural history course, or at least some good field ecology. So today, let's talk about ecology. Let's talk about fire ecology. That's the topic for today. In the English language, there's only one word for fire, and that is fire. And it all connotates bad things. I was just shown this morning a new book, hot off the press, Firescaping. If you build a house in the woods, especially like in California, the Chaparral, it's gonna burn. And people have wooden houses and wooden roofs, and the fire comes through, and the house burns down. It's terrible. And that's what we hear in the news is all these terrible wildfires. So here's a book on how to build a house with landscaping that might protect your house when everything around you else burns down. In our language, we have the fire department, fire insurance, um, the fire ploy, a fire alarm. Your house is on fire. Only you can prevent forest fires. Is there anything good about a fire? Well, in the Native American Indian languages, there were many words for fire. The fire that warmed your teepee, the fire that cooked your food, the fire that harassed your enemies, the fire that turned the prairie green and attracted bison. Fire is good for the land. Contrary to history, we've kind of been uh, taught that fire is bad. This is an old Courier and Ives print entitled Fire Fight Fire, Fighting Fire with Fire. You're not gonna outrun this big wall of wildfire. So you would start a little fire, and as that fire would burn, you and your horses could jump in the black area, and hopefully, by the time this wall of fire came, you had burned out an area big enough that the fire would go around you. Maybe, hopefully. This is a print of uh, railroads the uh, wildfires, a thing of the past. Well, it was railroad that started most of the fires. That funny thing on top of the engine was supposed to be a spark arrester, but there were still many sparks that flew out and caught the prairie on fire. Um, fire is not a thing of the past. Here's another one, a lot of explanation on this print. Uh, this is pretty low tech. These, some of these pictures have been copied from prints to slides to this to that. So if they're a little bit washed out, you can, you can see what's going on. Uh, the Great American Desert. The trees didn't grow out there. All of this Great Plains was worthless ground until they found out, well, maybe it does grow something. Maybe it is good. But they built their houses out of wood. The Eastern people heated with wood. They built fences out of wood. There's no wood on the prairie. So how are we gonna survive? What was the railroads that would bring wood out there? It would bring produce back to the markets of the East. So it really was the, the railroad that's responsible for the destruction of the Midwestern prairies. Well, I guess it's a good economic gain, but at the cost of all of our native prairies. Uh, plus the fire that the prairies burned. Plus, there were Indians out there. So it was a pretty dangerous situation until the railroad changed all that. People didn't even know how to navigate on the prairie. This giant sea of grass, you get lost out there. They were used to navigating in the woods where they could go along and come to a tree and knock a bunch of bark off. That was called a blaze. And they would blaze a trail. And they could follow their blazes on the way back. And if a lot of people were blazing trails and you got lost, you didn't know where the blazes you were. 
<laughs> That's where that really? term came from. <clears throat> Some railroads had better engineers than others. <laughs> so, interesting story about this railroad. This is an abandoned railroad. You can see the, the, the tie, the tracks are in pretty bad shape. It's kind of overgrown. This railroad was abandoned before railroads used herbicide to kill everything along the right-of-way. This particular railroad in Illinois, where Daddy and I are from, has some outstanding examples of native Illinois prairie. You have to go a long way before you can find these native plants growing in native habitat. Now, it doesn't look quite like that. The prairie is still there. The, uh, the, the landowners are burning the prairie. But now, there's a 22-mile paved hiking, biking trail. Everybody loves it. It only took us 20 years to convince the powers that be that this railroad ought to be a connecting bicycle trail. And there are some rail-to-trail conversions in Iowa, um, but there are more potential for rail-to-trail conversion. This one has the added advantage of having prairie. So the irony is, the railroad destroyed the prairie, and here's a piece of railroad that has the only surviving prairie left in that part of Illinois. Uh, fire is good for the land. Let me explain two topics today. A, why do we burn? Why do we burn the prairie? And B, how do we burn safely? Okay, A. Uh, number one, to remove encroaching vegetation. In the Lost Hills, we have a big problem with trees invading the prairie and shading out the native plants. Plants like Eastern Red Cedar, Sumac, Dogwood, Box Elder, Mulberry. Some of them are native, but with fire that eliminates these trees. Number two, to remove thatch. Gardeners call it um, <clears throat> mulch. Well, mulch is good, if you don't want anything to grow there. But if you have a whole year of tall grass, that mulch, that thatch, is going to prevent some plants from growing. Or it's going to take them a long time to get going. Plus, that thatch will absorb a nice shower, and then the sun comes out, and that water evaporates. Very little is left to penetrate into the soil. So, with a burn removing the thatch, we have plants like the downy painted cup, pest flower. There's, if you can see, um, porcupine grass, and the pink stuff is phlox. This is the hoary bacoon. This is, can you tell what that is? Yes. Um, <laughs> Local weed. Okay, this one, this one was a, this is a picture of an annual. Um, the fire will also um, expose the ground so that annual seeds can germinate and grow. Uh, this year we had millions of the false foxglove growing in early summer. Number three, timing is important to accomplish different goals. If you burn in late spring, you'll really hurt, suppress brome grass, which is not native. A cool season grass, we want to get rid of the brome grass and have natives. A late burn, a brome grass is pretty shallow rooted. So by hurting the brome, and then in the summer, this lust soil dries out, brome has a pretty hard time growing. Native grasses that form these nice flowering plants with deep roots can certainly outcompete brome if you damage it in the late spring. A midsummer burn will definitely suppress sumac and dogwood. A fall burn after the first frost will encourage many spring and early summer flower blooms. A burn any time of the year will eliminate junipers. Eastern red cedar, we should call it juniper. Um, <coughs> If they burn, they won't re-sprout. Many woody plants, you burn them, they'll sprout. Burn them again, 
they'll sprout. We have to do a lot of burning to get rid of some of our woody plants. Junipers, it's one good thing about juniper is if you burn them or if you cut them right at the ground, they don't re-sprout. Number four, recycling mineral nutrients. A little bit. If you burn something to a white ash, that mineral nutrient will, with rain, percolate back down into the soil. But we'll notice in our prairie fires, it doesn't all burn to a white ash like in your uh, fireplace. The ground is black. Gardeners call it biochar. Well, that blackness is what has created the black soil of the prairie. And that sequesters carbon. So that when the fire burns through, yes, some of the, the carbon is released as carbon dioxide. Some of it stays as biochar, as carbon. A lot of it stays underground as the carbohydrate that's produced on stems and roots that are underground. So a prairie fire is at worst a net zero. It really sequesters carbon. We hear a lot about carbon sequestration. Yeah, most of the carbon was sequestered during the Carboniferous period that lasted only 60 million years. And in about two human lifetimes, we're returning a lot, most of that carbon back to the atmosphere. And some people think it's not gonna affect our weather. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Prairies have evolved with fire. This is number five. Prairies have evolved with fire. Almost all the prairie plants have stems that are underground. An underground stem is called a rhizome. The only thing that you see above ground are leaves and the flowering stalk with the flower on the top. If a bison comes along and eats all that, or if a fire comes along and burns it, the stem is unaffected and it re-sprouts and comes back again. Okay, rhizomes. Very deep roots so that if the soil does dry out a bit, there's plenty of them. Farmers around here talk about a drought year and my prairie is just fine. Agricultural plants are annuals, very shallow roots. Prairie plants, extremely deep roots. There's plenty of moisture down there. Even after a fire burns and dries things out. Woody plants also, woody pl prairie plants, like lead plant and New Jersey, New Jersey tea we call red root and the prairie rose and hazelnut and prairie willow and choke cherry and plum thickets. Choke cherry and wild plum is not a tree. You see a lot that look like trees, that's because they haven't been burned. If you burn them, they'll sprout. You burn it again, they'll sprout. And pretty soon you have this beautiful thicket of many short, shrubby trees with abundant fruit. Um, they survive very well with underground growing points, buds under the ground. Number six, prairie plants have evolved very thick seed coats to survive fire. But if you have that sick, thick of a seed coat, it also prevents water imbibition, absorbing water. So the seed will survive the fire, but it won't germinate. So gardeners, horticulturalists, treat seeds with acid, put them in boiling water for a while, or put it in with sandpaper, or put it in a tumbler with broken glass to scarify it. All right. The fire will come along and burn some of that seed coat so that it will absorb water and germinate. Many prairie plants require a fire to germinate. Sure, some of the seeds are gonna get toasted, but many of them are gonna survive fire, in fact, require fire for germination. Number seven, there are no prairie forests. We don't have any forests around here. Uh, the fires burned all the trees, except for our oaks. Our oaks aren't fire tolerant, they're fire dependent. Oaks won't reproduce in their own shade. 
So if we don't have fire and the oaks grow and the canopy closes, there'll be no reproduction and the oaks die and we lose everything. I suppose in the past, over hundreds of years, an oak tree would die, that would expose a little bit of sunlight and an oak might grow there. But what the pioneers found out on the prairie were oak groves, a grove on the prairie of oak trees. And the stories say you could drive a team of horses through these beautiful groves. They were part-like, part-like. Not this closed forest of the eastern deciduous forest, which has a closed canopy, and before all the canopy closes, a beautiful flora of spring ephemeral plants that grow for a very short time, they flower, they produce seed, and then the canopy closes. We don't have that on the prairie. We today call them savannas, the savanna area. Um, let me go back to groves. So the pioneers then would settle in the groves because there was wood there. They built their house and fire and fence posts. Of course, they cut all the groves down. You know of, where's my list here? You all know of Ida Grove. How many know of Eagle Grove in Iowa? The time of Eagle Grove. Where Dottie and I are familiar in Illinois with Funks Grove, Elk Grove Village, Downers Grove, Villa Grove, Morton Grove, Fox River Grove, Buffalo Grove, to mention a few. Maybe you've heard of those towns. All those towns today are suburbs of Chicago. <laughs> it is just you know, one giant megalopolis. But the name survives. Why do they call it Villa Grove? Because that was a grove. Why do they call it Funk's Grove? Well, man, Funk started that. Number eight, we're getting there. Uh, Aspen Savannah, our granddaughter. We have a little savannah we're restoring on our property. And here, we're burning a fire right through the savannah. There are plants and animals that require savannah habitat. Plants that don't grow in 100% sunlight, they obviously don't grow in 100% shade of a deciduous forest, they require partial shade. About the only place you find these today are the edges of unburnt woodlands, where there's partial shade. Well, if you get rid of all the trees except the oaks, send fire through there, you'll have these savanna plants and savanna animals. There are many insects that are specific for the savanna habitat and birds and microbes and invertebrates that we don't know much about. Number eight, to restore a missing component. We harvest seeds and use those seeds to restore other prairies. Okay, so we're restoring prairie with seed. We collect seed. When Diane and I have an annual seed and feed, we invite people out to collect seed and we distribute that seed to other people. And we collect things like the nine anthrodelia. This one has, oh, the. Uh, tall sunflower, it has round-headed bush clover, it has side oats grandma, it has white prairie clover. Uh, the narrow leaf uh, milkweed, the compass plant, uh, the uh, purple coneflower. This particular prairie we burn every fall, we've burned for at least the last 10 years. And I'm recording the plants that are there, if anything, they're more abundant, and there are more species. The diversity is increasing. Uh, Brian Hazlitt at Briarcliff University invites his students out. Part of his laboratory's ecology class is to experience a prairie burn. This particular area is a nice little safe area. During our three-hour lab, we can get the students to experience a good prairie fire. So this one is part of our experiment with annual burns every fall. Okay, what else do we restore? We're talking about fire. Well, the Nature Conservancy has restored bison 
to the broken cattle grassland. The Rocky Mountain Elk Federation has restored elk to many areas across the country. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has restored grizzly bears and wolves to the West. The Iowa Department of National Resources has restored turkeys. I have a newspaper article about the first release of turkeys in Five Ridge Park. They're all over now. And a few otters and swans. We should be reintroducing prairie invertebrates, insects and spiders and the like, and microbes. We just don't know much about what species were there originally and should be there, where to collect them, and where to release them. So that component is, needs a lot of work. So by restoring fire, that's a missing component, a very important physical component that we're restoring by simply burning the prairie. Number nine, disturbance. Prairies require disturbance. Well, gopher mountains are a good disturbance. Badger holes, buffalo wallows, which we don't have anymore. Fire provides also bare areas, the disturbance that allows species to populations to repopulate in parts of our prairie. A necessary disturbance. Once you've experienced the, the before and after, once you've experienced how fire uh, stimulates the prairie, you become a pyromaniac. I admit, I am. So B, the second part. So how do we do it safely? Burning is not rocket science, but there are many considerations. So number one, many factors to consider. Uh, number one, we need to consider air temperature and air humidity, all right? Number two, we need to consider wind speed and wind direction. Number three, we need to consider fuel load. How much vegetation is there? The density, um, the moisture of the fuel load is important. Number four, we need to consider structures like houses, like barns, like wooden fence posts. Number five, we need to consider sensitive landscapes like gardens or an orchard, um, landscape trees and shrubs. Walnuts are not fire tolerant at all. We need to consider rare species. The rule is don't burn your entire prairie. If you have a nice 10 acre prairie surrounded by miles and miles and miles of corn and you burn everything, you're gonna burn up all your invertebrates, all your insects, maybe all of your reptiles and amphibians. Where are they gonna repopulate from? They can't. So burn half of it one year, the other half. I'm fortunate. I can burn a pretty big area, and I've got another hill there, another hill there, and so these are called refugia. But you'll notice on a big burn, it's not 100% complete. The whole thing burns. There are unburned areas, refugia. That's important. Rare species. Number seven, smoke. Maybe consider it of your neighbors. Which way is the wind blowing? Which way is the smoke going to go? Is it going to go across a road? I put up signs that say, slow down, smoke danger. You know, when you're driving along the road, two people meet in the middle of a smoke, it's probably going to be my fault. But I cover myself, I hope, with a sign that says, slow down, there's smoke on the road. Number eight, this is the big one. The mechanics of a burden. It should be obvious that fire burns uphill much faster than it burns downhill. Fire burns much faster with the wind than it burns slowly into the wind. Radiant heat from a fire is almost as hot as the flames itself. We have to be careful. So we have to develop fire breaks, a fire break. Well, water is a good fire break, like a creek or a river or a pond. A road uh, is a good fire break or a mode fire break. This is a mode path 
and we're starting the fire. Fire is gonna burn in the tall grass much faster and burn into my mode area where once the big flames are gone, we can then put out the flame that's creeping across the fire brick. Here's a road behind me and we're starting the fire and we have people watching that it is burning away from the road and not across the road. Of course, a plowed area is a good fire break. Timber, maybe. If it had a good dew in the morning, woodland, the savanna dries out much slower than the prairie. The prairie will burn, the woodland might be a good fire break. Fire doesn't, you don't have big tall flames in a fire, in a woods. So it's pretty easy to catch a fire as it sneaks through the woods. The best one, of course, is a black area, an area that has been previously burnt. If it's black, it's not gonna burn. Remember the picture of fire, fight fire. So what we're doing is starting a black zone on the downwind side. Number nine, equipment, Nomex. All these spots here are from diesel fuel that I've splashed on myself. And spots like this. If these were denim Levi's, it'd probably be on fire. But I'm putting my fire out. This stuff will char, but not burn. Maybe a, a little smoke mask. If it's really smoky, you want to stay away from the smoke, but sometimes it's good to have a little fire shield. Gloves. A drip torch, a flapper, rakes, water backpacks, a pumper with a hose and water. So equipment is pretty important. I've seen people doing mid-contract management with a shovel and short sleeve t-shirt and maybe even short sleeves and rubber gym shoes. No water. You don't have the equipment. If you don't have the equipment, don't do the burn. Number 10, ignition. That's lighting the fire, that's a drip torch. The uh, uh, Briarcliff students, the first burn we did this year, um, I need to be very explicit about how to use the equipment, what we're doing, why we're doing it. I draw a map of where we're going and we talk about safety. The second burn, these kids, pretty smart. They caught up. I mean, they just, here's the drip torch, okay. They know what they're doing, and the follow-up crew knows what to do next. Um, ignition was pretty good. Here again, our crew, um, uh, this Nomex, this is, I got some secondhand used fire department equipment. That's not even a fire department, that's old fire department equipment that I have people dress up in. So you start with a backfire. A backfire is one that's burning, either burning downhill or burning into the wind. Once you have a black zone, you can go around and start a head fire. Uh, this is also is a backfire. You can see the fire is burning into the wind. The wind is going toward the black zone. That's a head fire. If you start that, there's no stop on a head fire. That's going with the wind. Big flames. It's exciting. Oh yeah, this is the thrill. This is where you just kind of stand back and watch it because it's, it's gone. There better be something on the other side that's gonna stop it. Occasionally, oh, that's, um, a good picture of smoke. Right? Occasionally fire will go across your fire break. That's called slop over. And that's why you wanna have a lot of people doing nothing, it's kind of boring, watch that fire break. The fire isn't gonna cross it. But I don't trust the fire. I want someone standing there that's, the fire's over there, here's the fire break, it's not gonna go. Yeah, but I want you to stand there because if and when it does, I want someone there 
with a flapper or water on a backpack or to yell and scream, hey, we need some help here. So slop over happens. Um, the fire is big enough, it'll create its own weather, its own wind. I've seen what are called fire whirls, 30 feet of flame up in the air. Just a gentle breeze that day, and here's this mini cyclone of fire. And that thing might just go right across your fire line. Have to watch for those. A, an escape, an escape is a full-blown slop over, and there's nothing much you can do about it. An escape, you call for help. I have so far never had an escape. The Kanza Prairie Research Area in Kansas, have you ever heard about that? They do a lot of research. They wanted to burn a 20-acre research plot. It escaped, they burned 200 acres. No equipment, nobody was hurt. Kind of messed up their research because they burned some area every year. Some in the spring, some in the fall, some every three years, some every five years. Some areas they don't ever burn. Well, you burned 200 acres, you've burned up a lot of your control plots. So you have to adjust your research. That's called an escape. And then when you're done, you mop up. Mop up, you go around to make sure that the fire is out. What I, I did, I helped on two burns out west. Uh, what we were doing was the fire is gone, but the stump would burn and the stump with the roots would burn down the ground. We were supposed to take our gloves off and stick our hand down in a root hole to make sure that it was out. That's called mop up. After it's out and you're sure it's out, and then and only then is when you can wash down the ashes with beer. <laughs> then you're done. That's our house and it's still there. A few days post burn and the prairie starts to turn green. It's just amazing. You can tell the burn area and a couple of days after the burn, it's green or red. So in conclusion, for some illogical so-called economic reasons or excuses, we're seeing a decrease in federal and state and county resources that should be going to restoration and management. That's a shame. Not to mention land acquisition. These agencies should be buying more public land and they can't even take care of what they have. That's not good. Fire should become a seasonal celebration. We should develop a vernal and autumnal equinox burn tradition. We should celebrate the equinoxes with celebrating burns. Hallmark could sell cards for prairie fire holidays. Wouldn't that be cool? The Easter Bunny should be seen carrying a drip torch. Black Friday should have a completely different meaning and purpose. So, do you want to get involved with the burn? The U.S. Forest Service has several two or three day um, classes for certification. I have two certificates. The Nature Conservancy offers landowner workshops occasionally. Offer to volunteer or at least to go watch a burn. State parks, county parks, um, the Nature Conservancy, if and when they burn, uh, might be willing to have people come and stand and watch, or if you're able to even help. I can always use help. <laughs> Don't assume now, just because you've heard this excellent dissertation on fire, uh, this service, that you're an experienced fire technician. Maybe it is rocket science. There's more to it. Every fire that we do is different. And I learned something, should have done it. Should have uh, make my list, be more prepared. Every fire, I learned something. <sighs> Happy Thanksgiving, all. <laughs> I have a few brochures here.